biotoxins, except that for biotoxins, which is which are the toxins that are produced by shelf uh, by uh, microalgae, you can see that only five percent is reported from con uh, conception of shellfish and twenty eight percent from fish. But actually, this has been an underestimation because the, many of the symptoms uh, of intoxication with harmful algal uh, toxins are very similar to other intoxication and they are misidentified and misdiagnosed. Now we come to the cyanobacteria, the cyanobacterial harmful algae. Uh, well, they, they do occur in mainly fresh waters, but also in brackish and marine waters. The most notorious species is micro, microcystis, and to, uh, in, it occurs in fresh waters, and it is responsible for large blooms, especially over the past two decades. It's increasing everywhere in fresh water, in lakes, and when uh, it, it, it does, its toxins are soluble and it can contaminate uh, even freshwater reservoirs. And then you have Cylindrospermopsis and Anabena. They are also a notorious cyanobacteria in fresh waters. In the brackish waters, two species are very famous, Nodularia and Aphinosomenon. And then in marine water, Lingia, Trichotidismium, and Cyanococcus. To give you an idea about why these uh, Cyanobacteria are a huge problem for human health and for water security. As I mentioned, they are increasing, and we're going to get to the data of that. They do secrete several types of cyanotoxins. The most famous one is microcystis, and it is hepatotoxic, so it affects the livers. Um, the nodularin and the uh, cylindrospermopsis are also, uh, although they do occur, uh, and the species who form plumes, at a lesser frequency and extent than uh, microcystis, which is increased microcystins, they are also hepatotoxic. And then you have others that are secreted and that act on nerve axons, so they are neurotoxins. They can also cause uh, uh, skin irritation, gastrointestinal uh, problems, but they can also affect any other exposed tissue, like the eyes, and they do also act on the nerve synapses. Now, cyanobacterial blooms, uh, there has been a nice study. If anyone is interested in this or wants to get started in Africa and Egypt also, I recommend a, a, a review in 2016 that was published by Mbella and collaborators, and that gives an idea about where cyanobacterial uh, harmful algae have been detected. As you can see, it has been detected in the Alexandria coast in the Nile River also, and in fish farms. And it is expanding everywhere, and I'm pretty sure uh, that this is an underestimation uh, and that more studies are needed to monitor cyanobacteria in Africa and even in Egypt. Especially that Egypt is the top producer of fish, freshwater fish, tilapias, in the whole uh, African continent. To give you an idea why I'm talking about this again, this year especially, you can see I have chose two news uh, outlets. There are many of them. One in Arabic, since we are in Egypt, and this is uh, the recent coverage from Al Jazeera Net about a recently published uh, American study on cyanobacteria. You can see uh, on, on this news outlet the devastating uh, impacts this whole uh, cyanobacteria, very dense bloom can have, but also what they found or what they suspect is that not only this cyanobacteria can be um, water soluble and can affect us and affect other uh, through diet contact or through drinking uh, water contaminated with the toxin, but also they think that they can be transported in the air through water, very, very tiny water droplets, and they can affect us and other terrestrial animals. The EPA also uh, recently, over the past couple of days, is talking extensively about cyanobacteria because it is a huge problem now in the US. The EPA is the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States. The NOAA, uh, the NASA, 
uh, you have also the UK, the Plymouth Marine Laboratory. There are many scientists that work on harmful algal blooms and uh, also that are looking out for cyanobacteria. They are increasing in Asia also, not really in Japan, but in several lakes and reservoirs in Asia. And here I'm showing you a uh, NOAA, NOS, uh, NCCOs, uh, area, I'm, I'm sorry, satellite imagery of a huge uh, half of cyanobacteria that occur in Lake Erie. Actually, recently they are occurring more frequently at higher uh, intensities. What is in fluorescent green, those are the cyanobacteria. You can see the extent of it in Western Lake Erie. And here you have an idea about the increase of these incidents of cyanobacteria uh, in uh, Lake Erie, in Western Lake Erie alone. This is an intensity of severity of the blooms up until uh, 10. And you can see that although it fluctuates, but it has a, global, a general trend for increased intensity with, uh, and this is actually related to the bioavailability of phosphorus that is being driven by the Maumee uh, River, uh, at least in 2017, and that is increasing. So this is linked to human activities uh, in, 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 uh, that are bordering, actually, this river. And it's linked mainly to increased phosphorus availability in Western Lake area. Another very interesting study that was conducted in 2016 by Loftins and co-authors, it was a very nice and um, a, a, a very conclusive uh, study about the United States microsystem occurrence. In, they do occur actually in 48 states uh, as categorized by the World Health Organization relative uh, pro uh, probable health risk. So you can see here uh, the, global, the distribution all, all over the US. What is in red is, uh, sorry, not red, what is in white, it means that it has been monitored but was not detected. And then you have this, the different levels uh, according to the World Health Organization uh, health risk. You have the low that is in blue, and then you have uh, the, um, the, the salmon that is moderate, and then you have the red that is high. What you can see here is that it's almost present everywhere, and especially in certain region, notably the uh, uh, north and south uh, east US, and then in north and uh, uh, northeastern and southeastern US. Now, aside from cyanobacteria, all the other half of algae blooms are grouped uh, together. You can see here only by looking at these uh, scanning electron micrographs that are in, in uh, black and white. And the colored one are actually the, uh, the, uh, the, the light micrographs. There is a huge diversity, there is huge speciation, and they can be either pelagic or they can be benthic. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Japan uh, to give you an example how all these harmful algal blooms have been monitored, it, it dates back to as early as the year 731 here in Japan, and there has been, they have been keeping records about it, and then up until eight, uh, the 18th, 19th century actually, and then slowly in the 20th century they started establishing their own national monitoring program based on scientific research, not just observations. One of the best uh, studies that comes from Egypt about harmful algal blooms, including cyanobacteria, was published in Marine Environmental Research in the 2018 by Dr. Zakaria Mohammed, and he has an extensive list of the potentially harmful microalgae cyanobacteria in the Red Sea. And here I'm showing you that he actually did on both sides of the Red Sea, the Egyptian and the Saudi Arabia, but. Um, and identified an, actually an extensive list of potentially harmful cyanobacteria and algae. So this is something to watch out for, especially with the recent developments in the expansion of coastal tourism and the building of marinas. Uh, even resuspended matter can trigger harmful algal blooms. If you are interested into the details, there is an extensive list of potentially harmful algae, over 30 species 
although I do not uh, I, I do not agree with some, but I think this is a really nice study to, uh, to, to read for anyone who's interested in this problem that might occur in Egypt. It does occur in Egypt, but uh, I think it's an underestimation and more studies with a very nice routine monitoring should be uh, better and more data to be available there for, uh, for the global scientific community since the uh, United Nations uh, program on harmful algal blooms has initiated this global uh, data set so that scientists around the world can share it uh, plus the monitoring uh, program uh, of uh, every country that is even more detailed. To give you an idea why I'm telling you one should look out for harmful algal blooms, because the case of Japan is a very nice case that actually reflects what it means to have harmful algae unwatched or unlooked after. They actually didn't have that much harmful algae, the seeds were good, but the problem started when they started developing aquaculture and since the 1950s. The more what you see in the top is the total incidence of harmful algal blooms all around Japan. And then in the bottom is the total aquaculture production of Japan. You can see there is a very clear uh, similarities and very close relationship between uh, the production going up of aquaculture and the incidence of harmful algal bloom going up, up until uh, somewhere in the mid uh, 1980s. And then the harmful algae have been going uh, steadily down. They still here, they do occur, they are still problematic, but this happened because the Japanese have decided that they cannot expand aquaculture anymore. They need to reach a plateau to be able to control the occurrence of this harmful algae, and it did work. So as we are going into the, uh, the UN decade on ocean science, there is a lot of talk about food security. The alternative for overfishing our oceans, for overusing our land for agriculture, for not using properly water resources we are having, now problems everywhere, especially in arid environment about water security. So we need to be careful if we are going to opt for more production of aquaculture from the seas or even from freshwater environment. We need to think about what imbalance we are going to do so that we do not find ourselves wrestling with harmful algae. And trust me, these harmful algae are the alert that the environment is not doing well and you do not want to have them there like blooming over and over. Japan has wrestled with it with thousands and millions and millions of dollars lost over the years. Also, to give you another example uh, of this aquaculture that should be uh, monitored closely and should be done in a very integrative uh, way so that the environment doesn't suffer, Japan also wrestled with uh, aquaculture, with harmful algae in the north, in the very north, in the cold areas, because they developed the uh, scale of aquaculture. As you can see here also, their production, as the more that it's going up, the more they're having problems of environment. Another species I want to talk about that is not necessarily related to uh, aquaculture directly, but that impacts aquaculture and humans are the diuretic shellfish poisoning causes species, which are uh, represented by the genus Dinophysis. As I, I, as I mentioned earlier, it's the second most widespread uh, genus after Alexandrium. Here you can see they are very nice and very beautiful to work with. They are very, very beautiful to, uh, to watch under, under a scanning electron microscope. So I'm showing you this beautiful uh, ornamentation they can have. Here I'm showing you Dinophysis portii and Dinophysis acuminata. Acuminata, Dinophysis acuminata, is the most widely distributed species of Dinophysis, and it is uh, it is present in the Mediterranean Sea and it's present in the Red Sea. It is not a freshwater, uh, of course, uh, species. And I'm showing you another example uh, of uh, how the mismanagement of the environment, and this is the example of Japan. I'm also showing you the example of Japan again because they are one of the first and the finest uh, records about this comes from this country. That's why I'm doing this research here. You can see this is the distribution from, uh, that's the map of Japan. And then you can see the contamination of shellfish with the diuretic shellfish poisoning from 1978 up to 2001. You can see that they have been expanding from this, the, the north. This is Hokkaido, where they first occurred. They expanded all the way 
in these prefect coastal prefectures in the north, it is this is cold water, of course. Uh, and then uh, in the in the nineteen uh, between nineteen eighty eight and nineteen ninety two. They started occurring in other areas, notably on the other side of the Pacific in the Sea of Japan, and then even in Western Japan. And then, thanks to the right and proper measures, it is now only confined to the north, although we don't know yet why they are confined. We think there is, uh, there are, there is a more, more species specific uh, reason for this, for the production of these toxins and their occurrence. And many uh, studies have been conducted here in Japan to explain this. The Alexandrian species that was named in Alexandria in Egypt uh, causes paralytic shellfish poisoning in a human. This is really, really serious. And it can lead to pulmonary uh, arrest and to death. Uh, the leading toxin, although they do secrete several toxins, is, uh, the leading one is saxitoxin. It's, an, uh, of course, a neurotoxin. It is mainly produced by Alexandrian species in Egypt uh, over the past few, since 1995, there have been reports of blooms of Alexandrian monilotum, but also there are other species of Alexandrian. So Tamarense, Alexandrian Tamarense is very notorious. This species also occurs in uh, the Gulf of Maine. There is uh, Alexandrian catenella, which has a global distribution. This Alexandrian catenella is now a problem in Chile, for example. This is a problem that is causing high intoxication of shellfish with saxitoxins and analogs. And this species is also uh, a fish killer. It's the fourth most widespread fish killer uh, in aquaculture farms in the world. And it can it is becoming problematic in Chile with the salmon aquaculture. Chile producing the second, Chile being the second producer of uh, salmon in the world, estimated as Five billion at uh, five uh, billion USD, and then you have Alexandrian Tamia vanici. This is another species. There are many species, of course. This species uh, actually occurs mostly, mostly in in in, in higher latitudes, but it is adapted to others. And uh, these species, I'm working with these species. There is also the genus Gymnodinium. It's another genus that produces paralytic shell or poisoning. This species is actually problematic. In, uh, in and does occur in uh, Mexico. And you can see here also that if human activities are left unchecked, these species can start from one place and then they expand. This is the case of Japan in the 1978. They were, uh, they were in, Mie, uh, sorry, in Miyagi and Iwate prefectures, but then they started expanding all over Japan to the west and even to the south, the southern part of it. And even as of 2001, they were distributed even more widely, especially in Western Japan. So now there is, uh, there is uh, in Japan, the, the, the things are getting better, but they are still here. The thing with these Alexandrian species, and this has been, these cysts has been identified in Egypt. Uh, is that they do produce the cysts that are uh, very well uh, adapted to withstand unfavorable conditions. So they can live in the sediments, and then once the white and, uh, environment is there, they can rejuvenate and then they can form blooms. This is why Alexandrium maybe is one of the most uh, widely spread genus. So this is also to explain to you that aquaculture, that's now uh, Africa has been targeted, targeted continent for aquaculture and actually is the fastest growing in terms of rate, of course, not in terms of production or number of species. The, 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 the highest growth of aquaculture is now happening in Africa. So one should always be aware that once you start changing the environment, you will have the environment speaking back to you. and no aquaculture can expand without thinking about harmful algae. This happened in Japan. I'm showing you here that two species, Seriola uh, kinkaeratiata and Seriola dumerii, these are considered very fine fishes. They have a very nice uh, flesh. And when they started actually producing these high end quality uh, uh, fishes, they started having an increase of the incidence of HAP until they decided they are going to stop. Uh, 
to, to, to put one species at the plate of production. And for the other species, Jumerlii, they continued increasing, but they changed the aquaculture practices by, uh, by changing the feed, the, the food that they give, the feed type, so that they do not alter the environment and cause half of algae to bloom. Okay, I still have some time. Hello? I'm going to, I'm going to skip uh, Noctiluca sentience, uh, although it is present uh, uh, everywhere, but I'm going to talk about the fish killing half of algal blooms that occur in Western Japan and the, I'm sorry? Dr. Leila, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hello? In any case, I'm going to continue. Yes, take your time, please. Okay, so I'm, I'm giving you another mm -hmm. example of fish killing uh, species that are present also in Egypt, uh, in both uh, the, uh, the Mediterranean and in the, uh, the uh, Red Sea on the Egyptian side, of course. Uh, these fish killing species are uh, actually what we call rafidophytes. Uh, one of them is Chatonella, and then the other one that I mentioned earlier is Carinia. So one species produces neurotoxin that is uh, notorious in, in, in the Gulf of Mexico for causing massive ecosystem and biodiversity uh, uh, alterations. There is another species which is not toxic, but which is toxic, not toxic for us humans, it does not produce neurotoxins, but it is killing uh, other uh, aquatic organisms, and we still do not understand really well what is, uh, how this whole toxicity mechanism happens, because sometimes we think it's uh, oxidative stress, sometimes we think it's uh, unsaturated, unsaturated poly uh, uh, fatty acids, so there is still a question mark, and these species actually can have different mechanisms depending on the region where they are. So it depends on the strain, which makes it even more complicated to deal with these harmful organisms. So you can see here the damage in Japan, for example, since the 1970s to uh, the early <coughs> 2000s. You can see that they fluctuate, so you actually never know when this is going to happen. It's also a big question mark. We, we don't know very well what triggers it. So you, you can have one, one year, you can have a really high amount of damage caused by one species or the other, and then they disappear or they are there, they bloom, but they do not cause anything. So this is also a big problem. We don't know the relationship between the biomass of these harmful algae and the impact they do. We, we're not finding any any type of relationships. So the biomass of harmful algae is actually a problem and the species is present in, in, in Egypt. So it's Chatonella. They have many varieties, uh, Antiqua, Marina, or Ovata. And this species is mixotrophic. It's cosmopolitan. It occurs in tropical, subtropical, temperate uh, areas. It has a very complex reproductive cycle. It, it forms golden red uh, uh, blooms. Uh, and uh, it, it, the mode of uh, toxicity, as I mentioned, is very, very, um, very unclear. It could also be uh, causing uh, fish to produce mucus. In our research, we found they can also alter and cause uh, hypersecretion of music, mucus and asphyxiation of shellfish. So this is a question mark. This is a species to look uh, to watch for in Egypt, since it has been already identified as potentially harmful. You can see its global distribution. It is present in the Mediterranean. It is potentially harmful in, in the Red Sea. And then it is present almost globally and even in the Southern Hemisphere from uh, Brazil uh, and from Argentina, but also in Southern Australia and Northern uh, New Zealand. So as I mentioned, this is also something to think about. They have a very, very peculiar and very different life cycle with several types of germination. They reproduce sexually, they reproduce asexually. This is very important when somebody is thinking about uh, think about uh, answering the question, how does these Chantonia blooms uh, initiate? And if 
someone wants to see if there is a possibility to uh, act on uh, the, this sexual, uh, asexual, sexual reproduction to stop the blooms. You can see here the huge effects it had in, in, uh, in Japan. These are uh, millions of dead shellfish, uh, sorry, fish. And then you have Carinia that is also present in Egypt. This is Carinia mikimotoi. It is very small, it is not protected, and it is highly, highly uh, lethal for fish. Uh, it can form very dense red tides. Uh, in Japan, it occurred uh, somewhere in the 1933. Uh, I'm not very well aware uh, in Egypt when it has been identified, but it is in the list. It does occur in Japan, it does occur in India, in, uh, and in Korea especially. It does kill fish, but it does also kill all other type of invertebrates. And its mode of toxicity is still a big question mark. We are working on this. And Heterosigma acacio, this is another raphidophyte like Chatonella. Chatonella is also a raphidophyte that is present in Egypt. Uh, it has also a very um, complex as, uh, reproductive strategies. It reproduces asexually, it does form cysts, but it also forms resting stages. So species that do form resting stages and cysts are very, very difficult to control and are very, very difficult to study. In any way, this blooms everywhere around the world. It blooms in Japan, it blooms in Canada. Actually, it is very frequent and it does bloom in Canada every, almost every year recently. It is problematic in Chile. We are working together now uh, with my Spanish and Chilean colleagues. We just submitted our uh, research for uh, consideration in a very good journal. We're working on these species, uh, Heterosigma acacio, because it does kill the salmon uh, in Chile. They are also, uh, this species is also a problem in Brazil, in several European uh, countries, notably in the Netherlands, Scotland, Ireland, uh, and Ireland also is uh, the third largest producer of salmon in the world. They are also, uh, they do occur also in Norway, but in Australia and New Zealand. So this species is, has a very global distribution, even uh, much more than uh, its sister species and fish killer, the Chatonella species. And aside from killing the fish and the invertebrate, it does also affect the plankton uh, life. So this species has the potential to alter the whole uh, food web. And again, we don't know exactly how these are toxic because it's the same story as for the previous one, Carinia and especially Chatonella. So I'm talking to you about these, uh, these, uh, the experience of Japan because again, they have very good records, but I want you also to understand that these harmful algal blooms, they do change from one uh, over time. And we do not understand this succession, why in certain uh, periods, there is one species or a couple or three species that do form blooms and then all of a sudden pop, they appear, disappear and they're all of a sudden replaced by others. We do think that climatic condition, that the way we humans are altering the environment is triggering or opening niches for certain species over the others and so on and on. And that's why we are seeing new species that do form blooms uh, that have never been detected before in certain uh, regions or countries or even uh, areas. And then another species to look out for is Cochladinium polycrocoides. This is a species of dinoflagellates that forms uh, actually uh, 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 chains. It is highly lethal for, for uh, fish, but also for invertebrates. Its bloom uh, uh, toxicity is still unknown, but it can wipe out aquaculture farms, it can cause millions of millions of dollar loss at once, and it is almost everywhere. It is again in Japan, Canada, US, in Chile, uh, in New Zealand, and in Europe, and in Australia. And to give you an example how these harmful algae, once they occur, they become problematic. This happened in Japan, for example. What you see is that uh, in this uh, distribution map, the dots are actually, uh, the ones in red are actually the, the events where fish kills occurred, and the one in green are the events where this cochlodinium occurred, but no fish kill. So it is a big question mark why sometimes they are 
they occur, they form blooms, and they cause mortalities. And other times they can occur and form large blooms, but still they do not cause any mortalities. So we think that the toxicity is also not about the number of cells only, but other environmental factors uh, that triggers the production of toxins by these Coclodinium or other species that should be also looked uh, after. <coughs> also, to give you an example about how human activities are changing the environment and that why I said that these harmful algae are actually the inert, uh, it's uh, like a yellow card uh, before getting to the red card. Uh, so in Japan, for example, and in Korea, there was one species of coclodinium that occurred all of a sudden, and then they discovered that there is actually other sequences when they did the genomic analysis that comes from elsewhere that are different from the sequence that occur uh, in Korea. And by the way, this coclodinium species, when it started occurring in Korea, it became a huge problem for the aquaculture farms in Korea. And then to come back, and then they discovered that there is a new species that occurred all of a sudden in Japan and started forming bloom, which is Coclodinium uh, fulvescensis. So these species actually are thought to be transported via uh, currents, uh, and that the warming of currents along the coast, notably the Honshu uh, the, in, in southern Japan, but recently we've seen species that are actually warm water species occurring in northern Japan, in uh, 2015, 16, I think, and 17. Uh, so it's a question mark, how did they manage to come and live and bloom in cold waters? So maybe this is due to a warming of the sea surface temperature and warming of the major coastal currents uh, uh, along Japan that are transporting these species and maybe their resting stages. Uh, Another species that is very uh, peculiar for killing shellfish, this is just an example. This species has not yet been identified in Egypt, but it's something to look for uh, after. It has identified in Greece, actually, and Greece is not really far away from Egypt. Trust me, these species, when they, they are transported, they stay uh, in the background, but once they start blooming, they can cause havoc at once. This species, for example, in Japan, was never reported, never seen before, and then all of a sudden it started blooming and uh, forming huge, uh, very highly toxic blooms at very low cell densities and has wiped out uh, production, entire productions of shellfish for oysters. Actually, it was, uh, it, it, it's about 12 to 14 species of shellfish here in Japan have been wiped out. And it turned out to be even more toxic than uh, previous species such as Heterosigma that I talked about, the Rapidophyte, or Chatonella, or Carinia, or even Coplodinium, it is even more species, uh, more toxic, sorry. You can see that the warning level is at 500 cells per milliliter, and that the minimum soil quotas uh, for uh, having toxicity is one of the lowest at 1,100 compared to, for example, uh, 7,800 for Chatonella antiqua or 5,250 for Coplodinium. And it does actually uh, form blooms at very low equivalent uh, nutrients, such as nitrogen and phosphorus. So for example, for heterosigma, you need an equivalent warning level of 72 of, uh, phosphorus, of nitrogen. But in the case of this newly occurred species, 0 0.55 only. So just, it's not because the bloom is not there that the species are not there, they can be hidden. And in Japan, they think that this heterocapsus this circularis coma species, the notorious shellfish killer, that cause also problems and mortalities in Hong Kong, uh, has been a hidden flora for a long time. And for some reasons, some changes in the environment have triggered their blooms that occurred over and over and over in Japan for decades. Okay, I'm, going, I'm not going, I think we won't have enough time to cover this part, uh, but... I'm going to show you how this happened. So this is a uh, animation of when this heterocapsa occurred. I'm going to start again. So it occurred first here in 1988, and then it spread all over Japan. This is another example why harmful algal blooms should be watched and carefully monitored 
because once they go out of control, they can spread everywhere. And this is linked to the two major, most probably to the transportation with the two major currents, Hiroshio current and Tsushima currents along Japanese coasts, and to shellfish consignment, of course. And here are all the major Pacific oyster and pearl oyster farms along the Japanese coast. You can see that the distribution in, of the blooms is linked directly to the shellfish farms all around Western Japan and even in Northern Japan where the water is actually cold. This species, which actually thrives in uh, warmer uh, waters, have managed to reach that level and cause mortalities of Pacific oysters. To come back to dinophyses also, and here we're going to start talking about climate change. I'm going to give you examples of the most widespread two species, Dinophyses acuminata and Dinophyses codata. So Dinophyses acuminata does produce uh, dietic shellfish poisoning that affect us humans. And codata produces other types of, of, uh, of toxins that hope, thank God, does, do not uh, affect us. So this species is temperate to boreal and the most uh, cosmopolitan, and this one is tropical to temperate. And we did some um, some some experiments with it. You need to uh, be, to realize that this species is cultured only in a handful of uh, laboratories around the world. When we did the studies, there were uh, maybe six or seven uh, labs that managed to do it, but we did it at very high uh, densities. And I thank my collaborators uh, for this. We base our experiment on mixed assemblage of cultures, and this is what makes it very, very difficult because they do feed on a mesodinium, a marine ciliate, which also needs to be fed a, a cryptophyte. In any case, we did several uh, experiments and we tried to see the impact of warming and the controlled condition on their production. And we found that for Dinophysis acuminata, these are the different types of toxins, from ocadaic acid to pe uh, pectinotoxin DTX and pectinotoxin uh, 2 in uh, Decodata, you can see that the warming of uh, temperature, especially for uh, Dinophysis acuminata, triggers uh, a, uh, a, an increase, a differential production of these, um, of these uh, toxins, notably, sorry, notably for two toxins, ocadaic acid and pectinotoxin 2 but not very much for DTX. And in the case of the other species, the tropical species, actually temperature can have an effect, but only if it is warming. So why I'm showing you this is to tell you that warming of the ocean not only can affect the geographical distribution, uh, the frequency, as I said at the beginning, but we are finding that it can actually affect the, the type and the intensity of production of the toxins of human concern. We also did extra uh, experiments with the two species, and we also found that the, the warming affects the production through eff effects on the growth of, of uh, this, uh, these cosmopolitan species. And we uh, also found that the relative uh, toxin production is affected by temperatures, but also affected by growth, notably in Dinophysis acuminata, whereas the tropical species has a more wider and uh, response to these uh, warming of water temperature. And then, aside from this, we also did some experiments with this Dinophysis. Uh, we were actually targeting uh, the toxicity for human health uh, concerns. But we found the unexpected that shellfish starts dying. So this means that this species is not only problematic for us humans, but it does also affect shellfish. And this study, we've been working on this for quite a few years, and we are hoping to put out our uh, data after we finish it uh, sometime this year or uh, beginning next year. This is Dinophysis codata uh, that I'm talking about. It's also present in Egypt, and it's actually cosmopolitan. And when we did the analysis, we found that it actually produces only pectinotoxins, so not the two other uh, type of toxin, ocadaic and uh, uh, the DTX. And then we found that they, uh, these species can actually affect shellfish by killing differentially the species. So it does kill mostly uh, scallops over uh, noble scallops, which are in blue, 
and the least affected are actually the Pacific oysters. So very quickly, I'm going to show you what type of effects it can have. You can have here, for example, the effects. These are our histo histopathologies studies. You can see here uh, the Pacific oyster, noble scallop, and Japanese scallop um, gills. These are the normal gills that are healthy. And then you can see hemocytic infiltration here caused by dinophysis or hyperplasia, and even more hemocytes here in the case of the Japanese scallops. They do also form extensive uh, hemocyte infiltration and then hemorrhage in certain shellfish. They also affect the digestion and even the enzymatic activity by causing hyperplasia in the digestive system. You can see this is the hyperplasia I am talking about. Another type of hyperplasia in the intestines. This is the normal epithelium and this is the hyperplasia. <coughs> They also cause necrosis, depending on the species, and they cause a complete disclamation of the intestines. And in some cases, we even saw neoplasia. We are still confirming this, if it's statistically significant or not. And at the molecular level, they do cause, the species does cause a change in the antioxidant enzymatic activity in, in scallops, both species, where you can see that the superoxide dismutase activity, which is an enzyme that catalyzes the dismutation of oxygen radicals uh, into, because they are harmful actually, harmful to proteins, harmful to DNA, harmful to cell membrane. So their activities actually decreases, which means that there is an alteration that is caused by certain toxins that are unknown by this dinophysis. Again, we're talking about the cosmopolitan species. And the other activity of another glutathion S transferase activity is actually increased. So if there is a differential um, effect where the activity of the antioxidant that get rid of the oxy radicals is decreased, but the activity of the uh, enzyme that detoxifies uh, toxins is increased, which shows that the results that we are seeing are uh, quite peculiar. So this is just another example for you to understand that once you have a harmful algae, you are not even sure if this species is harmful only for humans or also for marine organisms, unless you test it and unless uh, you, you, you go into the details of it. Sometimes these uh, there are uh, mortalities that are unexplained and it could be caused by very low cell densities of harmful algae. Some species are harmful at several millions of cells per liter, as I mentioned in the beginning in the noxious. The algae that are toxic are actually toxic at very low cell density, a few uh, cells per milliliter or even a few cells per liter, which is the case of dinophysis. So for uh, climate change in general, now to try to uh, wrap up, I don't think I will have time to talk about uh, remote sensing. Uh, so just to wrap up, the global um, problem of harmful algal bloom, aside from the anthropogenic activities, aside from changes in the uh, hydrologic regime and the uh, biogeochemistry of lakes, rivers, uh, through damming, through um, aquaculture, uh, through mismanagement of, of, uh, of uh, coastal environments, without thinking, when I say mismanagement, I'm not saying we should stop building or doing what we're doing, but I think we should come up with a more intelligent way of integrating what is good for us humans on the socio-economic uh, aspect and what uh, what could uh, put us in a in healthy environment so we don't have to deal with even further damaging uh, to environments such as harmful algal blooms. To give you an idea, this is my colleagues, Wells and our co-authors, that have published a very, very nice review paper on the status of climate change and harmful algal blooms. This was in 2015, but it is still valid. And they tried to think about all the, uh, all the environmental aspects that lead to uh, changes in harmful algal bloom trends and responses. And of course, they put it very nicely how the climate change affects temperature, irradiance. They, it does also affect the, the, uh, the uh, 
acidity of the ocean. We'll talk about ocean acidification, which is directly linked to climate change uh, through decreasing the pH. And these ones do interact together to affect stratification, uh, the, the nutrients that are available in the water, and all together, this very intricate a relationship that not, are not, you cannot generalize it on a global scale. It must be a regional uh, scale uh, or even a more local scale, uh, depending on which countries and which area of the globe we're talking about. All these together will have an effect on the physiological responses of these harmful algae, on the grazing and the mortality's interaction with other predators, on the phenology of these harmful which species is going to occur and will be more uh, uh, prosperous in certain environments. And then, of course, this is going to alter the biogeochemistry uh, of uh, the whole process of harmful algal blooms. And this is what's going to give us the future trends in harmful algal bloom and response. And this is going also to dictate the way we are going to use remote sensing, which is a very delicate the remote sensing can detect harmful algae, but it will not be able uh, so far to uh, predict it. And um, there is a whole program that is going to start uh, very soon that is uh, a program of NASA to start a whole new uh, monitoring of uh, phytoplankton, including harmful algae blooms. So when it comes to finding a solution for harmful algae, aside from a better management of our aquatic environment, both the freshwater, the estuaries, but also the marine coastal environment, we need other tools. For example, molecular tools are now being on the uh, top um, top list of uh, finding a solution for these harmful algae before they occur. One of the recently published papers in 2021 comes from our group, actually. It is uh, led by Dr. Satoshi Nagai, which is a very uh, famous uh, genom genomicist uh, in harmful algal bloom, and we developed an absolute quantification method using uh, the ribosomal RNA gene copies numbers for eukaryotic single cells using uh, a digital uh, PCR, but this has been also applied to harmful algae to detect 16 species, and it gave a very, very good results. Uh, you can see here that uh, by using the 118S uh, uh, RNA gene uh, sequences, uh, we, we were able to actually uh, detect several uh, species, including harmful algae, and with this, I think, I think I'm going to end this uh, training. And if you have any questions, uh, please uh, let me know. And I hope you enjoyed the ride. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Leila, for this informative lecture. And uh, we now, we, you highlighted actually several areas that need to be addressed by uh, Egyptian researchers. And I think this will trigger somehow a brainstorming um, and I think the best practice to mitigate or uh, decrease uh, the causes and the consequences of harmful algal bloom is that collaboration between Japan and Egypt uh, to transfer the technology. And thank you very much for this lecture. Now we have three questions and a raised hand. Let us start first with the questions from uh, Dr. Samia Mikhail. She is a professor of phytoplankton and specialized in red tides. And she's also a student uh, of Dr. Halim, who first uh, discovered the, uh, recorded the Alexandrian in uh, Alexander. So uh, the first question from Dr. Samia is, um, she is asking who uh, recorded Chattanella and the Heterosigma uh, species in Egypt and where? I'm sorry? She asked who? recorded Chattanella and the Heterosigma species in Egypt. If you Who have recorded? Any... Yeah, Chattanella um, and the Heterosigma species, yes. If you have any- I have, I have the information, I can send you the information. I don't have in, in my mind who recorded yes. it. Yes, but- Because okay. there were so many species that were recorded in Egypt. Yes. But I can uh, send the information if you, if you, if you, if you need it. Okay. Um, uh, One second. Okay. 
I, I might find that we can move forward, but I might yes. find that you can you can send it in the um, chat box. There, yeah. If you find. Okay. I'm, I that, that's, found it. That, okay. The second question from Dr. Samia it, about heterocapsin circular coma. Yeah. Uh, already identified and recorded in Alexandria Coast. She is giving an information about this. Ah, okay. I okay. was not aware of it. <laughs> it's the last time it's I checked. Okay. <laughs> it was already in uh, Greece, but I was not aware that it reached uh, already Alexandria. Yes. So uh, uh, it's another uh, additional reason to watch out for this species. Yes. And uh, now we will allow to give the floor to Dr. Asma Ahmed Adawi. She needs to take the floor. So I will allow. Uh, Hello. Just, just give me a second. I will. Okay. Dr. Asma. Okay. Uh, Dr. Hanan, if you can hear me, you can give her the floor. I'm not the admin anymore. Dr. Hanan. أي دكتور؟ ممكن حضرتك تدي دي فلور ل لدكتورة هيلا طه لأن أنا مش الأدمن دلوقتي. You can give her the floor. دكتورة هيلا طه. هيلا طه. دكتورة هيلا. دكتورة هيلا طه. أيوة أيوة خلا. أوكي دكتور مع حضرتك. سؤال حضرتك. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I, first, I uh, want to thank uh, Dr. Layla for uh, her uh, effective uh, lecture. Uh, also, I want to ask, uh, you hear me? Yeah, okay. Yes, Dr. Soha. Yes, Dr. yes. Layla, Dr. Soha. Yes, yes, me? you can hear you. Yes, I am here. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, I want to ask Dr. Layla uh, why we can detect uh, a new species uh, of uh, harmful algae, although we uh, have a lot of new technologies uh, uh, nowadays. Uh, I, um, I uh, saw from her lecture that uh, uh, the last species detected or new species detected uh, from um, 1992 or, uh, and 1995. Uh, this is the first question. Second question, uh, I want to ask about um, uh, toxins uh, from cyanobacteria in the air. How the scientists uh, detect uh, cyanobacteria toxins in air? I wish to know. Uh, they actually okay. did a study. They, uh, they actually just published this study, I think, a couple of weeks ago. They did not, uh, they impaired from a analysis of the toxins in the water, and they found that potentially they they did not detect it in the air. So practically, they did not use any technology to say here we detected it in the thin air or in the air transported above the the bloom. It was an in inference from their study on the bloom. Um, load and the, 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 the toxins. They did not find it actually in the air, not yet, but I think this is where they are heading. It was an inference from, from, from the biomass and from the load of the toxins. Okay, okay, thank you. The first question, can you, oh. can you please repeat the first question? I don't think I, I, I heard you well. Uh, uh. From your, your uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Hela, uh, Aywa. can you please uh, ask the okay, first okay, question? Okay, I ask the first clearly. question again. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, uh, from your presentation, okay. uh, you, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you present that uh, some new species detected uh, in 1992 and 1995. Okay? Uh, from yes. this time, uh, uh, there is no uh, detection of new species, yeah. although we had uh, a new tool or a new molecular <laughs> tool. 
I'm still listening to you. There are some uh, echoes I'm so in the sorry. background. So, um, okay, uh, you're talking about, I will, I will give you the floor in five minutes. So, uh, I think you are talking about coclodinium that was detected in 1992 and then 1995? Yeah. No, it's still here. Mm. Uh, uh, it, so, the, the species are still present, but they do not form blooms anymore. Certain species, mm. they, okay. uh, they appear, they do form blooms, they form persistent blooms, devastating blooms, they can be even recurrent, so they occur over and over the years for a certain uh, span of time. It can be a decade, a couple of decades. And then for, no, for reasons that are still a question mark, a question mark because you cannot expect, you are expecting them to be persistent forever until you find a solution for them. But actually, for some reasons that we don't understand, may be linked to our activities that is altering the environment in a way that is not more sustainable for the species to grow, they do uh, disappear. For example, one species is Heterocapsa, the species that you, you're, uh, that Someone just mentioned it's already in Alexandria. This heterocapsa has been blooming every year, every year, everywhere in Western Japan. And then recently, its blooms have become, uh, it's there in the background. It is reported by monitoring program present and at which cell densities, but it is no more fish, uh, killing the shellfish. So nobody knows why, but it's there and it has changed. Nobody knows why. So this does happen actually. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think the nineteen uh, the nineteen ninety two is about coclodinium. Coclodinium is still here. It's still, for example, in Japan, it does cause uh, mass mortalities, uh, even recently. But what I wanted to show is that it wasn't there. It was not detected. It, no bloom of it has been seen before, and then it it started occurring. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much You're for welcome. this question. Okay, um, we have only three minutes um, for the uh, second lecture, Dr. Mustafa Fouda, and we have one more question. We can ask, um, uh, we can just try to address this question. Um, Dr. Ahmed Hinesh from National Institute of Oceanography and Fisheries is asking about the methods to decrease the harmful impact of cyanobacteria. If there is, if there are any methods to decrease the uh, Harmful effect of cyanobacteria. Well, the first, uh, the first thing uh, when it comes to cyanobacteria is the nutrient load. So pollution, misuse of the lands uh, that uh, around the freshwater environments, uh, uh, and uh, agriculture runoffs, uh, the uh, river uh, regimes when they change, when the hydrology change, it can contribute to the sustaining of certain cyanobacteria and of course climate change. So this is a, um, a problem that is global, but there are recent uh, companies uh, in the United States, for example, and in other that are trying to find uh, uh, solutions to harvest these uh, harmful algae cyanobacteria and take them out from the environment there are other uh, uh, development, like like technological development, that are uh, being um, used or being developed to uh, mitigate the problem of uh, cyanobacteria. If you are interested, I can send you also the information about it. So maybe uh, Dr. Suha, or maybe now, uh, once uh, Dr. Mustafa Fuda starts. I will get you the information and I will share it with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Leila. Thank you for this very nice picture. So now we welcome Dr. Mustafa Fouda, the Minister Advisor on Biodiversity, uh, Ministry of Environment in Egypt, and will be giving a very nice lecture about human affairs and marine science. Dr. Mustafa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I need some help because uh, uh, I'm just trying to see how I can share screen. Yes, you uh, can. 
yes. The, the I have it already in front of me. I have it already in front of me. So if you have a technician or what, uh, uh, I'm trying you can, to you see. Just, you, you can share the screen from the, you can click the uh, green button down the. Um... Yeah, I see it. Okay. I see it. I, okay. I'm using it, but uh, uh, just a second. It looks like. Okay. Can can you share you it, see now? it now? Okay. Yes. Yes. I, I'm sure it now. Yes, I can see. Do you see it? Yes, it's very clear. Thank you. Yes, we can see it. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Now, uh, after this uh, interesting lectures, I think we should have uh, uh, taken break because it's uh, interesting and it will take some time to uh, uh, absorb what you already said and all what I can say to Dr. Lella if she's hearing me, if I still remember my Greek uh, words. Anyway, the reason why I, I uh, choosing this title is uh, because long time ago when I was studying in UK, uh, a professor known as Sir Frederick Russell. He was one of the best marine scientists in the world. He came to university and he gave a very nice presentation about human affairs and the marine environment. I was fascinated by the presentation and I have hope that one day I will be able to make something like that in my own style. Then later on, after 10 years, Professor Gohar, who was, uh, I'm very proud to say he was my godfather, he made another presentation on the same issue, and it was also fascinating. So I tried to see if it is possible to make something like that in one day. So this presentation is a general. Uh, it is not very, very specific because it touched upon many, many issues that are related to human affairs and the marine environment. So we'll deal with primarily with three issues. The main assessment that was done over 10 years by World Ocean Assessment. The second one is the first time marine life in 2010. And that was a major work that took almost more than 10 years. And we had much better information about marine life. And the third one, my own personal uh, experience. And you could see on the first, on the hand, that me, that was me in 1970s. And the other one on the left, that was, uh, was Professor uh, Kassas, who we call him the father of environment in, in Egypt. And the third one, if you could remember, or you could recognize, that was Carter. Uh, the president of the United States. So I have reasonable experience with many head of states. Just very briefly, I have made that presentation or part of it a few years ago at the National Institute of Oceanography in Alexandria, but the time was not enough to cover the whole issue. So briefly, we provide information about the marine environment to a great extent in terms of the uh, percentage in terms of the depth, in terms of people, in terms of the uh, amount of water, whatever, etc. This is a brief description of the marine environment from different places all over the world in terms of the habitats, in terms of the tropical area, which showed that diversity of species are much, much higher than in other areas like polar areas. So I will move quickly because I want to get into the bottom of the whole issue. But before we leave that, it is very, very important for those people that they keep talking about the sea is an endless of solutions for many, many uh, business or shall we say wastes of human, whether plastic or whatever. I'm telling them more than 50% of our oxygen we breathe, they come from the sea. So if we pollute the sea, that means we are going to suffer more and more in addition to all the that you can get many, many surfaces that, that are provided by the marine environment, whether it is fish or renewable energy 
or sources for all fresh water that we need every day and certainly the use of for transportation and mineral many 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 things so we are talking about the marine environment that the, as an ecosystem that provide human uh, huge services and products to human being in egypt here i cannot stop uh, saying that we are very proud that Egypt has many, many pioneers that they have started uh, the marine science long, long time ago, more than even a century ago, starting with King Fouad, who already uh, helped Egypt to buy the first uh, ship called Mabahis, and many people, who, especially the old people, uh, they remember Mabahis uh, that used to uh, explore the marine environment in the Red Sea and the Mediterranean as well. Professor Hassim Fauzi, the pioneers of marine science, and my professor, Professor Gohar, and many, many others. So we have many scientists that, uh, scientists that they have already provided numerous contribution to the marine science, not only in Egypt, but all over the world. Certainly, king of the Red Sea is Professor Gohar, that he worked for more than 50 years in the Red Sea, and he was one of the best scientists all over the world for a long, long time. Not only that, but he was able to make the Red Sea, uh, especially the Hurghada station, that it was the only marine station in the Southern Hemisphere for more than 25 years. So we're talking about the Egyptian contribution to the marine science at large by good known like Dr. Goha, whom I knew when I was a student. And then when I visited England as a student as well, I was surprised by the uh, uh, knowledge about Goha by scientists in UK. And uh, certainly I was uh, honored to be one of his students for many, many years. But certainly when I went to study you in UK uh, for my PhD, uh, I used to communicate with on many, many issues related to the marine environment at large. So just reminding those people that they didn't know Goha. I mean, he was known to public long time ago in 1970s and 80s as well, but he made a major contribution on the uh, Dugong uh, in the Red Sea, and he was a human being that you should, uh, or shall we say, I was very proud to work with him. He was very connected with the King Farouk and well as many, many other uh, royal families uh, like the Monaco, like Japan. Uh, he was very close to the, even the emperor of Japan to the ex extent. So he made a major contribution, not only in Egypt, but all over the world. And he, as you could see in many, many conferences or even the way how we used to study. So I am, as a Mustafa Fuda, I'm very proud of this man. Not only Goha, but in Egypt, we have witnessed many, many expeditions uh, that go back to the time of Hapshistut, uh, the, the queen Hapshistut, that uh, she sent the first expedition to the Bant countries in the Southern Red Sea, where they brought back many, many uh, goods that helped them uh, in their way of life. But certainly these are examples of the different expedition that came to Egypt, whether it is Bola or Challenger or Jerome from all over the world. They came to the Red Sea and the Mediterranean to explore our environment to great extent. So briefly, but it started not only in recent years, but certainly it goes back to the time of ancient Egyptians. And uh, this is uh, even one of the good stuff about description de l'Egypt, they were able to uh, describe many, many, many species. So uh, Muhammad Ali era was uh, fundamental put down the even foundation sto uh, stones for many people that they were sent to France to study and certainly that helped to 
make the first marine laboratory not only in the Mediterranean, but even in the Red Sea uh, by the Swiss Canal, by the Cairo University, whatever. So we have a long history to talk about it. And this is Mabahis, if someone was familiar with this uh, boat, uh, Mabahis, um, in one of these, uh, I think we celebrated 50 years of uh, work uh, in the Red Sea and Mediterranean, and we published uh, a very comprehensive uh, report uh, that were, I think, published in Deep Sea in 1983. So we have many scientists that they came to our Egypt long time ago, for scale that described hundreds of species of plants and animals. The same thing for Robel, he is German, Kronzinger, Crossland, all of these people that they came to learn from Egypt as well, because at the time we had many people that they were able to uh, explore our uh, uh, environment to a great extent. So these are examples of the most important foundation stones, whether it's an Institute of Biology, that in uh, Qayyib Bay in 1931, the Institute of Hydrobiology in uh, Shadbi, uh, and certainly uh, John Mary expedition that with. So these are examples of the foundation stones that enable us to know more about <clears throat> what happened or what is happening in the marine environment. These are examples of the old publications from Hurghada, and this is the one that I mentioned to you then the deep research that was published uh, in 1983. And this is a new version of the Egyptian journal of research. So we have contributed to a great extent in all aspects of the marine environment, whether it's physical, chemical, pollution, marine biology, geology, fish, aquaculture, coastal lakes, marine protected areas, climate change, and many, many, many others. So these are some of the areas that Egyptians were able to tackle in many, many years. And this is part of their publications, whether it is related to specific issues like seashells or specific issues related to the marine environment to a great extent. So these are examples of the good work. I mean, I'm very proud of this one, which is related to the checklist of the Egyptian Mediterranean fishes by one of my good friends, Ragab. Uh, anyway, uh, if you go in details, you could see the work that have been done in uh, places like Lake Rolos from 1990 until, uh, sorry, from 1973 to almost 20. You could see how the Lake Borolos look like by remote sensing and how this have changed and, and reached a where almost half of all the uh, lakes had disappeared due to many, many, many uh, issues with their land reclamation or many, many activities and whatever. This is another important issue that we in Egypt, in Egypt that have contributed to what we call ecologically or biological significant marine areas that was headed by the CBD Convention on Biodiversity, where we were able to identify some places in Egypt, like the Nile Delta Fan or the uh, Wadi Gimal in, in, the, in the Red Sea. This is an example of the Nile Delta Fan that has many, many interesting uh, features, whether it is the uh, bathymetrics or the uh, canyons or specific species, especially very specific habitats like the gas hydrocarbon or chemosymbiotic communities, endemic mollusks, deep sea coral communities, a lot of stuff that we need to show to the world. And we're very proud that we have uh, a very important and interesting uh, species that we have uh, uh, made to uh, the global community. This another EPSA that we have nominated or recommended for uh, to be included in the list of all world EPSAs. And that is what the Gimal Elba, where uh, again, it is completely different from Nile Delta Fan, 
and it shows you that we have more than 200 species of corals, more than 400 species of fish, high endemic species, and many, many other uh, information. Even if you go to the iconic species like dolphins, like uh, in Samadai, for example, uh, uh, we have uh, many uh, different species. I think uh, we have up to about 17 species now, the last uh, version of it, but it shows you when we talk about number of species of dolphin, they are not only individuals, but we have hundreds of them to a great extent. This is a summary for the endemic species in the shallow water uh, of the Red Sea, and it shows the rate of endemism as well, which is very, very, very high compared to other areas in the world. I'm very proud to mention that few uh, slide that I will show now. It is one of uh, our student, his name Ali uh, Hussein. Uh, I have examined his thesis only a few weeks ago, and it is in line with what Dr. Della uh, Lila already mentioned. This is analysis of algal bloom over 20 years period and uh, using satellite images as well. And it was very, very interesting because we were able to see the annual variation, monthly variation, and even seasonal variation to a great extent. Not only that, but based on the colorful concentration in Egyptian water, you could say most of all of this information came from the coastal area to a great extent. Not only that, but he was able to show the algal bloom in different places along the Egyptian coast, especially around Alexandria. Uh, and it was true because we were able to, uh, he was able to show what kind of pattern of algal bloom. Uh, over 20 years, he was able to record 321 events that uh, cover many years and he was able as well to show that over years and years uh, he was able to combine both the satellite detection and field event as well and i agree with dr lella that fish mortalities not only fish mortalities even shellfish and vertebrates we have witnessed several ones and i think she has uh, already shown that in some years like 2015 and seven, that was true to a great extent. Moving from regional, uh, from shall we say, uh, uh, normal or national contribution, we can go a little bit high by looking at the regional efforts that Egypt contributed to a great extent. And you could see uh, this person was the Minister of Environment, Mag George, and it was uh, <coughs> Prince uh, Turk uh, from Saudi Arabia. And certainly we were able to produce many, many bubbles that came out of what you call Bersiga. It is the program for the environmental studies in the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden. And even the Mediterranean, a lot already were uh, made, uh, whether the state of the uh, Mediterranean environment or specific issues. Uh, uh, I don't know, something wrong happened here. Are you following me? Hello? Yes, we follow you, yes. Okay. Uh, so the contribution at regional level, not only in the Red Sea, but even the Mediterranean, and we went to even global. So I personally have participated with many, many Egyptian scientists, uh, either in expeditions or publications related to specific issues uh, like the uh, invasive species, for example, and many, many other that we were part of the whole process, not only uh, contributing to the science, but even uh, contributing to the marine policies all over the world, whether it's CBD or Barcelona Convention or other. Not only that, for taxonomy, we're able to work together with IUCN in a way that we have produced several books about the red list of the IUCN, 
not only that, as well in the living planet, Bort, that was quite old. Uh, now we are dealing with uh, the new one, which just came out very recently, but show you where are we now at the global level, whether it is at specific uh, species or specific habitats, and that continue on and on. And these are examples, not only that scientific uh, contribution, but even we went further to the economics of biodiversity. We're able to know how much we know, uh, the value of the uh, biodiversity in terms of dollars. We reached that uh, recent figure of $43 trillion that are free of charge, that are produced by the ecosystems and biodiversity to a great extent. So these are some of the publications that Egypt has contributed to a great extent, whether in science review or in other specific areas. This is the level of me when I was young, watching, looking at the uh, electron microscope. And at the time, we used to work, you have to go to the water, get the water, analyze the water, get sample, whatever you could see with the recent technologies all over the world. You don't have to go to the water now, either with remote sensing or any changes had happened. It is interesting and to see how the world uh, were able to assess the marine environment and how much information that are available for many, many places. So you could see now part of that Egypt had attributed to the World Ocean Assessment. I cannot remember who that, but certainly we looked at the impact of climate change and leakage changes in the atmosphere. And as you could see, the Delta, Nile Delta is really a threat. And we have witnessed and documented sea surface temperature, sea level rise, oxygen acidifications, salinities, and many, many things like that. Actually, the Mediterranean now is one of the hotspots for climate change to a great extent. We're able to look at the IBCC assessment board that had made it very, very clear that uh, uh, the impact of climate change certainly on human well-being and biodiversity, as well as projected impacts according to the number of scenarios that are set. No, we are responsible to a great extent for many of the activities that we are, that they are related to the uh, marine environment to a great extent. This is an example of the work that were done in ocean acidification, and you could see all over the world, we have huge uh, data about the many, many areas, whether it is the uh, minerals or the pH, or even we're able to get some of the decision makers. I don't know how many of you remember this one. Does anyone remember this one? But anyway, he was a vice president of the United States, and he was very interested in climate change to a great extent. Even Egyptians were able to look at the history and the geology of the ocean to a great extent, and as you could see, where the, for example, the Arabia was not there. The Arabia was down in the thousand uh, bowl, bowl to a great extent. So this is the current situation where the, you know about the modern world now, not only that, but we're able to look at all of the issues related to the, uh, shall we say, uh, climate change, change in terms of just salinity, sea level, whatever. When you look at the human impact or the implication of human well-being on biodiversity, I agree totally with Dr. Lilla that uh, have witnessed a lot of in the life cycles of species, but certainly the ice cap already now is melting to great extent. Uh, fish stocks are uh, have reached the maximum uh, exploitation to a great extent. And so these are some of the 
uh, uses of the environment, of the marine environment, recently some marine cables, especially in Egypt here, it is considered as a regional harvest to a great extent, and certainly a terrification problem that already presented to us by Dr. Lella. And back to climate change and biodiversity, we have witnessed many, many species that they have migrated to a great extent, not only the migratory species that they have shifted their breeding range, not only that, but certainly uh, many mismatch, mistiming of the biological shift. That means that species now, instead of reproducing in uh, spring, now they are produced early as well. And many of the issues that are related to uh, climate change, whether the mangroves, coral reefs, especially coral bleaching, wetlands. And these are the issues that we have contributed to a great extent. And this is an example. Over 20 year, 30 years, there's an increase in temperature of the Mediterranean by one degree. This is higher than the global uh, level, which means that we have to move very quickly in the Mediterranean and see what can we do, especially in hot, uh, spot areas, either in Egypt, like the St. Catherine, for example, or Gabal Elba, where we have already uh, available information, not only about the wetlands or migratory species or specific uh, communities like Ombit, and uh, that represent the, north, uh, the northern geographical distribution and whatever, etc. This is an example of global warming and the reduction of warm water fish. This is a model that used to be, uh, this is uh, the, the usual, uh, shall we say, maximum sustainable level, but we are very close now to go to a level that can contribute to uh, uh, disappearance of many, many, many of species. So we have witnessed many mortalities and less successful reduction. Uh, as I said, uh, the fish stocks already stand for almost two years. It hasn't increased at all. It is true that aquaculture has increased considerably over the years by using different technologies, and Egypt was one of them as well. Uh, we look at the level of catch, especially non-target fish, uh, or mammals, or seabirds, marine noise. This became a various and serious problem now in the Mediterranean Sea, where the noise have affected greatly the migration of many species of fish and uh, marine mammals as well. Certainly the implications of all of this is related to the food resources and the species structures. Some species already have shown that uh, uh, have decreased or shall we say, even disappear to, to a great extent. Gradients of biodiversity. This is another interesting assessment to show what we know now about the marine life. We have 2.3 million species, excluding certainly bacteria. Uh, only 10% already described. We know enough about the biodiversity pattern of many, many, many species. And certainly we have seen gradients in terms of specific species or specific areas, whatever, and again and again, implications of the food, implications on the oxygen production, uh, implications on the shore protection, especially on the western part of the Alexandria where urbanization is taking, uh, is Feeding up very, very quickly, and we didn't know what would be the impact to a great extent, and certainly iconic species of whales, dolphins, and certainly implication our society to a great extent. This is another important uh, level of information about the census of marine life that came out in 2010, and it shows you that when we work together, we were able to look at the results of four, 540 uh, expeditions, more than 2,000, actually 20,000 species, uh, sorry, scientists that from 
all over the world that they have produced in terms of books, papers, websites, whatever, and certainly the new technologies and part of it again was presented by Dr. Lilla about the barcoding, especially the micro species as well, microphones, automated reef monitoring now is not you don't have to go into the water and certainly one of the most important thing that came out over the last few decades in the global ocean uh, system and certainly the standardization for that this is an example of the new technologies so when you look carefully to all of that you could see all the marine oceans or sorry the oceans and the sea are exploited or have been explored to the extent either at deep sea, especially when you use submarines like that, or using boats or using uh, aeroplanes and whatever. So, so this is the use of technologies, whether it is related to remote sensing or actually getting actual data or photographing species that you cannot get out of, especially deep sea, a lot can be said new technologies that are available. So that recently we could say we have now 30 million observations about the marine environment. They cover around 200, uh, 250,000 species as well. And they discovered more than 6,000 new species and many, many rare species that we know nothing about except the species itself, the name of the species, whatever. But certainly this is very interesting to see how the world have changed about our information. But at the same time, when you look at the changes that happen in the marine environment, and it's not only the species that they show uh, changes in abundance and distribution, but even they change even the size. I mean, if you take something like the swordfish, for example, in 1860, now, uh, 1930s, and now perhaps it is much, much smaller than that. And these are in them, uh, some of the species that have their sides over the years. And uh, we have witnessed some of these activities to a great extent. Everywhere in the marine environment, whether it's ocean or in the environment, we have intensified, intensified the use, whether it's due to our urbanization everywhere, or aquaculture and marine ranching, or shipping as well. I mean, we are talking about more than 55,000 boats in the Mediterranean alone, for example. These are some of the uses of the marine environment and certainly human being were able to make use of them, whether it is as a food or as a source of energy or as a conservation in terms of marine protected areas, whatever. So not only increased in space, but increased full material. And uh, I think the presentation on harmful algae bloom is one of the example, but certainly when you look at marine debris, especially plastics, for example, this is a, a, a disaster. I mean, I will mention something about it. And certainly it has implication not only about food security, but even human health as well, and the marine biodiversity to a great extent. This is an example, how much we know about marine debris. But even so, we're able to look at the goodies that came out that means the cost or the estimated cost of making use of the libraries itself by getting something like $13 billion every year that you can make use. So if you have a problem, there is always opportunities, whatever. And uh, we are talking about five ways of looking at the waste in terms of reducing the size, uh, reusing it, recycling it, recover many of it as well, redesign. I mean, uh, I have seen and I have in my own house uh, examples of the use of the marine debris, uh, especially from plastic and other, you can make even uh, shoes now uh, and even jackets and whatever, things like that. But sad, when you look at some specific issues uh, like hypoxia, 
and nutrient reduction in coastal areas, especially in the coastal areas of Egypt. It is very, very, very sad. I don't know what can we do about it. Cumulative effect or impact of human activities in the marine environment certainly is not only about the marine biodiversity, but some species that they have gone forever and we cannot get them back. Uh, some species we can recapture them or rehabilitate them or restore them, whatever. But certainly, this is the work of many, many institutions all over the world and international organizations like uh, conventions of CBD, Barcelona conventions, and other as well. But certainly, uh, these are examples of the human activities to a big extent. We have to remember that the benefits to human being are immense, but at the same time, there are this benefit because of our activities or human uh, activities on the marine environment to a great extent. We are dealing with uh, incredible loss of marine biodiversity to a great extent. Uh, marine transport have reached a stage where we, the marine environment cannot take any more of that but certainly we are benefiting from the marine uh, energy, especially gas, and mining, whatever, tourism. We can talk about it for a long time, whatever. But certainly one of the goodies that we came out, especially genetic resources from the deep sea, it is one of the very interesting uh, approach or promising the integrating management in management activities. We have to integrate all our activities. One of the questions that I wanted to ask Dr. Lela is, what is her recommendations for the future, either for scientists or for decision makers to a great extent? We have to integrate all of our human activities. We cannot work in geographical isolation anymore. The whole world now talk about the marine integration uh, to be able to conserve these resources to use them properly, or shall we say sustainably to a great extent, but at the same time, you have to look at other issues related to the international trade, especially the, uh, what we call sustainable production and consumption to a great extent. We have to deal with the coastal degradation uh, from land-based development sources as well. And in Egypt, we have already documented the impact of land-based sources on the marine environment T or in the material. So successful management of human activities, we have to sit together. We are in the same boat and that's what we call it, uh, mainstreaming of our activities uh, from different sectors together. It's not an easy to get everybody and agree in principle because people until now, they think about the, uh, shall we say, sectoral approach rather than a uh, cross-cutting approach. We have to uh, think in terms of uh, sustainable development and many people don't know even what does it mean. It's about a process, long-term process. Uh, it, is an, uh, I, 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 it is a concept or approach of how do you address a problem from ecological, from environmental, from, eco from economic, from social, whatever, etc. And certainly to sit together, we need to see how the interactions of different pressures on the marine environment uh, to understand it. And certainly you deal with some of the problem, whether it is sewage problem, pollution problem, marine debris problem, whatever. So better integrated management, will require existing knowledge and identify knowledge gaps. And this is exactly what we're trying to do now to a great extent. Certainly the last uh, assessment is the urgency of addressing threats to marine environment. Many bars have been seriously degraded. We have to acknowledge this, but what can you do? Can you rehabilitate it? Can you, uh, 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 what can you do in terms of rehabilitation and restoration to that extent? What you do with the cumulative impact of problems that we are already suffering from all over the world as well. Lost opportunities, 
That means that if you don't take action now, it will be very, very chronic problem in the future. And sometimes it costs a huge amount of resources that we cannot offer, especially benefit from integrated planning, planning and management to great extent. We have a lot of technologies that can be used to great extent, but we have to be sure that technologies is not only solve the problem, but sometimes create problem as well. So we have to be very, very precaution in terms of using the technology to a great extent. I'm talking nowadays, what you call it GMO, genetically modified organisms, we use technologies, and then you get a lot of uh, problem from uh, these GMOs to a great extent. While we are working, we have to identify barriers or critical problems and at risk. In Egypt, at least, we have trained a lot of people and we pay a lot of money, but we have not been able to retain them or to give them some assembly because we cannot afford uh, their expertise. They can go anywhere else and then they can get 10 times uh, salaries than what we already offer. Underfunding it is a real problem. Lost opportunities to generate substantive re re uh, revenues. This is another problem. And we have problem that we have nothing to do with it. It is external. It is related to security and the Middle East, for example, or safety or law enforcement, whatever, not only at regional, but even at global economy. And I think the best example now that we are suffering for more than one and a half years now from uh, Corona, which is, so we have to identify all of these uh, barriers and problems. We look at the institution. We need institutional reform. Without institutional reform, business will be as usual, and that will be a serious problem. We need to transfer from bureaucratic management to objective-oriented performance culture. We need to go from centralized planning and budgeting to devolve financially and technically at specific level. It doesn't make sense that a decision is taken in Alexandria. You can do it in Marsa Matrua, for example. Both of them are completely different in terms of people, in terms of technologies, in terms of problems and whatever, etc. We are suffering from decision makers that they can take decision without going back to the uh, beneficiaries. So we need decisions by guided by policies and regulation. Certainly, financing is another uh, problem. We need to be self-financing. We need to scale up that we deal with whoever we deal with sustainable development goals. We have to learn what are the lessons learn from all of that. Political support is essential for us. Building census is vital. Local community involvement is critical. Marine protected areas are effective conservation tools. Selecting appropriate staff is crucial. Dedicated well-trained staff is very, very important. And certainly economic benefit is a must. So these are the ideas that we need to scale up based on our knowledge and the experience that we developed over years. And that's why sustainable development goal number 14 that deal with the blue water, that means that marine environment, we have a specific goal that has many, many programs and many projects that covering all over the world to a great extent. We have to learn from successful stories as well. For example, the National Institute of Oceanography they are covering, uh, well, they are monitoring marine water quality for almost 24 years now. We have protected areas that are representing almost 15% uh, of the Egyptian territory, but this is for both land and marine exists. We have integrated marine, uh, integrated monitoring and the seismogram, and certainly we have uh, strategies and national action plan uh, whether it's for biodiversity or for integrated coastal zone management or solid waste, whatever. So there are many good stories that we can learn and build on all of this. Example. This is an example of 
protected areas. We have a, a network of 30 protected areas that covers 30 percent. We have system plan that already developed. We have more than 15 protected areas that need to be declared based on our future plan. Most of habitats are represented in the Egyptian environment and many important archaeological sites already presented, especially the cultural heritage and many traditional cultures, whatever. This is an example of what we have already learned from marine protected areas. But again and again, we have knowledge, but still we have many, many gaps, whether in the marine environment, physical structure is still need especially deep sea uh, environment composition and movement of marine waters uh, there is indication that the currents for example is changed to great extent biota the marine environment is still we need to know especially the algae and macro species and ways in which the human interact with the marine environment these are the gaps that we need to address to great extent the other important issue related to gaps as well is our capacity. Can we do, can we say that we are professional? I mean, for example, if you take the research vessels, Mabahis that worked for more than 50 years, and now the existing research vessels, I don't know, recent reports about the two research vessels that are owned by the National Institute, but we have no research vessel in Latina. So we need capacity building to a great extent to be able to look at all of these issues. No, where are we in terms of habitat deterioration, in terms of the overfishing, pollution, invasive species, climate change? If we put those together, then we can go to the management issue, which is vital to you. Know. There are many questions that we need to address, especially we need now marine conservation strategy, either for the Red Sea or Mediterranean or the whole Egyptian marine water. What do you have already know? What are the gaps? What tools that we need to support marine resources and certainly scientific uh, policy interface that's related to that. We have a lot that we can make use in terms of the roadmaps, in terms of uh, other options. Uh, uh, the way how I personally add the marine biodiversity conservation in Egypt to a great extent. If we take part of it, I was able to develop personally marine biodiversity strategy by saying by 2030, Egyptian marine resources and ecosystems, whether it's natural capital, are essential component for sustainable development and eradication of poverty in Egypt, guaranteeing their proper and fairly use in a joint ethical responsibility. That means it is a responsibility of everyone that requires innovation, sharing knowledge, coordination, to mainstream marine resources in all relevant development sec uh, sectors, and to guarantee social involvement and benefit with the fact that Egyptian citizens is one of the corner stone of building this society, eradicating poverty. And this is a vision that I developed five years ago, and it is entirely up to the institution like National Institute of Oceanography to consider this vision, to change it, to adapt it to whatever. Even we looked at the objectives of that strategy that should be based on scientific ground rather than anything else. And not only that, we want to very, very specific start with conservation because without conservation, you cannot use it properly. And then without using scientific knowledge, you cannot go forward or uh, make good benefit or sustainable use of these resources, whatever. So these are some of the objectives. They are available for someone who may need like, like that. I tried to see if it is possible to can put all of this strategy in five main pillars that related to conservation, related to integration, improvement of knowledge, and improving awareness because awareness and 
in educational programs, but certainly partnerships, partnerships with all relevant beneficiaries, uh, uh, or shall we say, uh, uh, all partner, whether it's, uh, uh, shall we say, the private sector, for example, uh, industries, whatever, certainly implementation of research and development, because without R&D, we'll forget about it. Without this, you can destroy the great environment to a great extent. I have looked at even priorities. What kind of research priorities that is needed? How can we improve the baseline knowledge of marine uh, biodiversity from the level of ecosystem to a great extent? How can we stimulate the production of monographs, especially algae, for example? I don't know how many species of algae. I mean, I was very close to Professor, uh, late Professor Yusuf Halim, the father of marine environment to, uh, in the Mediterranean and Red Sea as well. But certainly, these are some of the priorities that we need to look at in terms of knowledge, in terms of books, in terms of what level of understanding about the population dynamics and things like that. Certainly, special and temporal scenarios for what is needed. So these are of the research priorities that I am recommending to be considered. I'm not saying that you have to develop, but certainly without economic opportunities, especially fisheries, aquaculture, marine biotechnology, ecotourism, we lose a lot. But at the same time, we have to have recommendations. If we have marine science, that means that we must have a marine science plan. We need to have a marine observing system. We need to have data management and especially e-science. I know that there is very interesting uh, department at the National Institute of Oceanography in Alexandria, uh, but I never seen reports that came out of the huge knowledge that already is stored in that place is uh, human capacity development. We have to continue doing it. So these are some of the recommendations uh, that we needed. And I'm very that Marine Science Conference, now this is part of that, and it is a good way to do that. And I have explained that in details, what kind of database that we need to do uh, in terms of detailed geographical comprehensive database, field surveys, GIS database, networks at all different levels. So success, we have to be sure that we are doing is a sign of success. And the best way how to do it is to have what we call it exit strategy. If you get out of it, you have to go back again. So you need to put or to set the right framework. You need to offer local support, especially fishermen, fishermen for example. Ownership, especially fishermen again, getting people involved, creating alternative livelihood, especially if people suffer from uh, pollution, for example, spreading success stories, introducing new standards, especially in methodologies, whatever, and so on. These are some of the elements of success to great extent. What I would like to mention is, I have about this for almost 20 years now, and until now, I don't know why. I sit with people, we agree, and then once we finish, they go back again and think. The whole world now is talking about special, special uh, planning, especially special marine planning. It is a process of analyzing and creating special timber distribution of human activities to achieve ecological, economic, and social objectives. It is a framework for implementing an ecosystem-based management to support. It has its own principles, whether it's ecosystem based or it's based on integration, place based, adaptive, and whatever, etc. We need to start this. I need to see study comparing different places along the Egyptian Mediterranean coast to see the special planning. It's not only planning, but implementation. It has specific steps 
that we need to consider. And all of these steps are well known, starting our needs, for example, we need to get support, certainly, whether it's financial or capacity building, we need to organize ourselves. So these are the key uh, steps for marine special planning. But we have to remember, special planning is not an easy. We have a lot of questions. Decision makers don't understand it or find it very difficult to understand it or they do want to do it, whatever. Lack of understanding. Uh, at the level of planning, technical capacities, whatever. These are some of the constraints. So we have to keep in mind if we are going to do it. Uh, I'm pleased that the Minister of Planning now already start thinking about the special planning, special planning to a great extent, but we need to be very specific about marine inspection. And we have an example. In the Mediterranean, we have what we call good environmental status, GS, and it is based on the ecosystem approach it has very specific objective. We developed this, and Egypt was part of it as well, over, uh, I think, since 2008, yeah, 2008. And we covered many, many of the species, not only biodiversity, invasive species, fish stock, food webs, eutrophication, whatever. If anyone is interested in all of this, uh, you are most welcome to contact me, and then I can guide you to the right uh, people in terms of the indicators, in terms of the fact sheets for all of these informations to a great extent. The last part of my presentation, because it, the time is running out now, is about blue economy. The whole world now are talking about blue economy. It is a green economy, except it is wet. It is water. It deals with economic viability. It deals with the social uh, acceptability, environmental sustainability, but it has very specific themes, whether it is dealing with the transport, oil, gas, industries, fisheries, aquaculture, whatever. So blue economy is like any other economy, green economy, whatever. We need to go away from the brown economy. We need to go even to circular economy where we know we have no waste anymore. But these are the main themes of uh, uh, blue economy. I'm very glad that these are some of the work that artwork that were made by Gohar and Dr. Uh, Jenny Clark in 1950. You see the quality of photographs, just remind young people. Now, if you don't have, uh, if you say I don't have enough facilities, well, this is the work that was done when uh, there is no even good uh, cameras to a great extent. I'm very proud to say that I was one of the people, a few people that were able to produce uh, a new generation of scientists or researchers that they deal with the marine environment to a great extent. I think it is now very close now to 12.30 now. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't bore you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mustafa. Well, this is a very important lecture about the marine biodiversity of Egypt. And thank you for highlighting the knowledge gaps and the possible solution to realize the SDG number 14, life underwater. We thank you also for your continuous efforts through past years and contributions to promote and support strategic plan of marine biodiversity of Egypt on national, regional, and international levels. And finally, we thank you for, with, uh, for your continuous collaboration with National Institute of Oceanography and Fisheries. So please, uh, if you have any questions that, uh, directed to Dr. Mustafa Fouda, you can uh, take the floor or drop your question in the Q&A section. I think uh, we have here a question from Tunisia, but I think this question is directed to Dr. Laila Albasti. Can you join us, Dr. Laila? Dr. Laila? Yes, I am here. Yes. We have a question from Tunisia, from uh, Abir uh, Garbi. Yeah. Uh, uh, she is asking um, in Tunisia, and because of the wastewater discharge into the sea, are we more and more affected by these toxins? Well, uh, as I mentioned in my uh, previous training lecture, that. Once you start altering the environment and putting in nutrients, 
uh, not only phosphorus and nitrogen, but other such as vitamins, you are changing the um, ecological um, niches for certain species to occur. So mainly for when it comes to harmful algae, you are going, if you have pollution, if you are inputting um, effluents that are rich in phosphorus, rich in nitrogen, in organic matter, for sure harmful algae will develop. However, you need to understand also that you need to monitor it and to prove that these are harmful algae. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Layla. Uh, participants, please, if you have any more questions directed to Dr. Mustafa or Dr. Layla, would you please take the floor or drop your questions in the Q&A section? Okay, we have here, we don't have, okay. I will wait just for a couple of minutes to think about any question you want to ask. We have a great opportunity here. Dr. Mustafa and Dr. Layla, they can answer all your questions. Dr. Layla can answer your questions about harmful algal blooms and Dr. Mustafa, any question about the marine biodiversity region? There is, uh, there is a question from, again, from Dr. Samia Mikhail, uh, but directed for Dr. Layla. Yes. Uh, ah, okay. She is just confirming to send her the information that she asked for. Oh, yes. The, okay. uh, the paper about the cyanotoxins in the droplets in the air? Yeah. Um, no, and, not, uh, not this question. She, is, uh, she, asked, she asked about the Chatonella species and the Chatonella Chim -sigma. Chim -sigma yes. and the, the, yes. She also asked about cyanotoxins in, in the uh, in droplets. Thank you. Uh, I think that's the question of Dr. Hela Taha, but, but you can answer both questions. They are very important. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Uh, so please participants, so you don't have any more questions, Dr. Mustafa? Uh, uh, Dr. Mustafa, can I ask a question? Comment? Yes. Yes, please. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Lila two questions. Yes. Uh, because certainly the overviewed the global overview about the situation, the current situation of the algal bloom that she presented is very, very interesting. It has attracted the attention of many, many organizations like the UNESCO, like FAO, like World, uh, World Health Organization, and many, many institutions all over the world. For non-specialists, how can you differentiate between harmful algal bloom from non-harmful? Because still, this question raises many, many things uh, because sometimes algal bloom is useful as a food, for example, especially in Lake Brolos, for example. And I'm getting worried that we have reached the stage where, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, saturation of Lake Manzala because of the aquaculture activities and there are signs of harmful algal bloom. So that can destroy uh, uh, a huge amount of fish, fish resources. So differentiation between harmful and. The other question is related to how can we see the future, either for both doctor or both graduate students, what kind of research that we should focus, and at the same time, what kind of recommendations for decision makers. It's not enough to raise a problem, but certainly we have to find a solution for the problem itself. How can decision makers can and uh, can interact with such results? So we predict, for example, as one of my students over 20 years were able to know exactly when this algal bloom over 20 years. Can we predict them in a way that we can stop activities, for example? I, I don't know, but uh, we need some kind of recommendation for policymakers. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, so the first question, how to know if the, 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 the bloom is um, beneficial or harmful, the only way is to check which species is there and to identify it. Um, we don't have any ways to know whether uh, which species is which, whether we use 
uh, uh, remote sensing or whether uh, we just use colors, it's we need to identify, identify the species under a microscope. But then there is the other problem is that the identification of species, certain species, they look alike, but they are different. So we are now moving towards molecular tools. We're moving towards using chips that can give you results within a few minutes and that can be transported and can be used by anybody uh, uh, even even publics if if they are if they are trained or if they are trained into how to use the chips these are the tools of the future molecular technology on, on site and uh, very fast um, uh, chip like uh, and easily usable uh, devices that can give you a positive negative uh, result these these are the most practical solutions to determine whether the, the, the waters the, or the bloom that is being seen is harmful or not. Because after all, these blooms are caused by species. And it's the species that we know that determines whether it's harmful or not. There are no other alternatives so far that I've known of. Uh, for what can we do about this? I do not think that we will be able to stop these harmful blooms anytime soon. They're going to be around as long as we do not find a solution for the bigger picture. You mentioned in your in your uh, you did a, a very very great presentation about biodiversity, but also within all the context of the of the past, of the present, and the future solution for this. If we want to reduce the the the, the occurrence of harmful algae, we really need to start thinking in a more globalistic approach of finding a solution to the environment that we have altered on land, on the coast, and even now in the deep sea and the open oceans. We really need to be much more thinking about the true management of how we are using our uh, both uh, hydraulic resources, water resources, and our food. We really need to think about the economic activities that are uh, directly related to aquatic environment. Uh, we need to think about tourism. We need to think how, how we are doing. We are going to answer the water scarcity by uh, creating another problem. Desalination is a solution for water scarcity for people, but it has also side effects as a technology of altering the environment. We also need to think about uh, the the uh, the uh, chemical plants and what kind of uh, of of, um, of technologies we have. To use like uh, like for uh, for example reverse osmosis and we need to develop technologies that are more efficient at treating all the effluents that we produce from industries that go directly to the aquatic environment. We also need to think much more in a more regional and global scale. Our problems in uh, Japan can affect the Koreans, can affect the Chinese, but not only that. It's the same thing for Egypt, especially the Mediterranean, as you mentioned. It is one of the global hotspots for climate change. It is warming at unprecedented rates. So we really need to think much more global. We have to stop thinking within frontiers. We have to think uh, uh, in much more wider way. And as you mentioned, we need to think about an economy that would support this and a new way of dealing with the environment, which is the blue growth. We need to think about better tools to allocate spaces in the aquatic environment. We need to really try and think about how we can use marine spatial planning effectively and how we can explain it to the general public, how we can explain it to the technician, how we can explain it to the scientists, how we can raise awareness that we do have technologies, but they are not being used. For instance, marine spatial planning is not a new concept. It is a new concept now everywhere in Europe. It's being talked about. But well, actually, it has been around for more than 40 years here in Australia. They used it to manage their Great Barrier Reef because it is the lens of the oceans, one of the lens of the oceans. They have been used in Vietnam. They have been used even in China to try and see uh, solve the problem of the use of the aquatic environment, the marine environment, or what we call also maritime environment. So we really knew, need to come together and have our technologies the scientific approach, the methodologies uh, that are uh, developed everywhere uh, and apply them at a much more wider uh, scale so that we can solve problems, not only harmful algae, but also biodiversity, for instance, 
our stock fishes that are depleted. We're talking about a very alarming rate of deplete in the Mediterranean. We're reaching up to 90% of the stocks of certain fishes. We really also need to think about climate change. Climate change has been on the uh, agenda of the UN, on the agenda of several environmental institutions for decades, as long as I remember since I was young. I've been hearing about this, but I'm not seeing any practical solution. So the practical solution maybe relies in changing our ways, uh, the ways we are using our resources and make it more sustainable and environmentally friendly. One of the solutions for that, that will have uh, definitely an effect on decreasing harmful algae and, and, and improving the ecosystem, both on land and in the aquatic environments would be decarbonization. And this is, uh, is in the agenda of Southeast Asia backed up by Japan. It is also the, the aim of the European Union. And I think it's going to be what we're gonna talk about during the whole decade, a uh, UN decade on ocean science. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, response. And I hope that the organizing committee of this conference will take into consideration all of the issues that were raised in the two presentations uh, in, the, in, in the preparation of, uh, uh, shall we say, recommendations for the future activities, especially uh, marine special planning. I hope the National Institute of Oceanography will take part of that in the future, at least their projects can focus on all of this. Again, you are uh, Greek, right? No, <laughs> Tunisian. <I'm Greek. laughs> I hope they do. Well, I hope you are Greek because I I, uh, I I said something in Greek to you, but uh, you didn't get it. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, Dr. Lela. I didn't hear you. Uh, what was the Greek one? Hey, Dr. Mustafa, that you are Greek from Greece. <laughs> no, I am from Tunisia. <laughs> yes. Tunisia. Oh. Yes, I am from Shukran. Tunisia. <laughs> Shukran. No, Shukran. I said, Sa I said Sarabouboli. Okay. I heard uh, it, but I didn't understand uh, it was it was directed to me because I don't speak Greek. <laughs> I hope okay. I hope I can speak it though. Well, it means very simple things. I love you. Thank you so much. I love you too. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you everyone for this very interesting lectures and Dr. Mustafa, all the recommendations are being noted and the uh, sessions uh, are being recorded and we will extract and analyze these lectures and we will post them on the uh, uh, YouTube channel of the uh, National Institute of Oceanography and Fisheries and we wish for continuous collaboration with, uh, with you, uh, Dr. Mustafa and Dr. Leila from Japan. Uh, and please, for all participants, uh, don't forget tomorrow's sessions, very important lectures about uh, the status of uh, dugong conservation in Egypt and phytotoxins from bivalves, Dr. Ahmed Shawi and Dr. Salwar Saidi, uh, starting 8 a.m., uh, 10 a.m. to 12.30 uh, p.m. Cairo time. Um, thank you, everyone and uh, see you tomorrow, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, yes. we'll see you soon then. Uh, I hope this presentation will be available for citation by anyone. Yes, this presentation is recorded and will be uh, uploaded on the YouTube channel of the uh, National Institute, in Institute of Oceanography and Fisheries and uploaded on our website as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you much. so much. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Uh, <laughs> well, first, I'd like to thank you all for organizing these uh, these training lectures and for inviting me mm -hmm. uh, and for your time, of course. Uh, Dr. Mustafa Fouda, thank you very much for your very informative presentation. I really liked it a lot. Uh, aside from this, um, I would like to, of course, uh, thank the Hydrology Laboratory and especially Dr. Suha. Thank and you. everyone who was involved in the organization. I hope that one day we will uh, work together on, into a collaboration. Aside from this, Dr. Suha, I haven't registered yet for tomorrow. Uh, is, it, is the registration still open? You Yes, the registration is open and you can use the same link, it's public. So you can use the okay. same link and you have that, the same link. You can use the same link tomorrow, okay? Okay, I, I will be using the same link as today. Yes, the same link for everyone. Okay. Panelists and, oh. and, and, and participants, you can use the same link, okay? Perfect. Sure. So, 
I can yes. extend uh, what already Dr. Lela mentioned now to all participants because I was overwhelmed by the number of participants. Yes. I mean, we have reached almost 75 uh, participants yeah. from many, many places. Yes. And uh, I'm very grateful. And I hope that uh, participants will be able to make use of this uh, presentation that you will make them available to everyone. Thank you very, yes, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Musa. Thank you, Dr. Thank Dr. Leila. You, Dr. Okay. Thank you. See you tomorrow. And, and of course, thank last you. but not least, I would like to thank all the attendees and I hope they enjoyed these lectures. Yes, sure. sure. Have a great thank day you. and see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Okay. Ma salama. Okay, bye bye. Ma salama. Ma salama. Bye bye. Ma salama. Bye bye.